Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're joining us. My name is Dalia, and I'm the community manager here at Kong. Today, we have a very interesting topic presented by Greg. We'll have him introduce himself in a second. We're going to talk about fallback configurations in Kong Ingress Controller 3.2. So very new, very interesting topic. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So we will upload the recording to YouTube and you will receive a follow-up email with the recording and some useful resources um, in the next couple of hours or so or later today. Um, please use the Q&A function on the bottom to put all of your questions there rather than in the chat. We can keep track uh, what is answered and what's not. And then I will also include the link to our YouTube channel in the chat so you can um, watch the video later. Yeah, please, Greg, take it away from here. Uh, thanks, Dalia. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our user call. Uh, I'm Grzegorz Burzyński. Uh, I work on Kong's Kubernetes team. Um, I am responsible for maintaining and developing our ingress controller, gateway operator, and uh, anything Kubernetes related that allows our users to use the gateway in this environment. And uh, today I will speak about uh, how we enhance resilience capabilities in our ingress controller by introducing <clears throat> a new feature called fallback configuration. Uh, so first um, I will explain why we, or rather our users needed this feature, presenting a painful scenario that some of you may experience in the past. Uh, later, I will take you on a brief journey through the evolution of error handling in Kik that we embarked roughly from version uh, 2.7. Um, after that, we will take a look at the new fallback configuration feature basics, uh, just to give you a general idea of what it is responsible for. And with that uh, context in mind, we will proceed to explaining some of the design decisions that we made during uh, the development of the feature. Um, at the end, uh, I will run a quick demo showcasing the feature. Hopefully nothing breaks. Uh, so yeah, first we'd like to understand why we why we needed this feature in, in the first place. Um, let's imagine such a situation. Uh, we have two application developers. Uh, let's name them Alice and Bob. Uh, they work in the same company. Uh, the infrastructure uh, is set up in a way that they share the same Kubernetes cluster. Uh, they both deploy their applications to the cluster as well as the, define their uh, ingress rules or HTTP routes, uh, anything that exposes their apps to the public internet. And there's also only one ingress controller in the cluster, so they share a common gateway that makes the services uh, public to the world. Um, in the starting point, uh, both uh, Alice and Bob uh, have created valid routes in the cluster, and their apps are available under al slash Alice and slash Bob uh, paths. After developing some new fancy feature, uh, Bob needed to change his route, uh, let's say, to slash Bob enhanced. A quick git commit push PR uh, was approved. CD pipeline pushed new Bob's route to the cluster. Mm, but uh, Bob's mistake wasn't caught in the review, uh, nor in the uh, controller's webhook validation. And the invalid route configuration got too far in the pipeline. Um, current configuration generated by the controller is not accepted by the con gateway. and because Bob is based in a time zone different from Alice, and he pulled the changes just before the end of his uh, workday, uh, let's say it wasn't a big change, uh, he said, what could go wrong? Uh, later, Alice starts her, uh, her day, and she also changed something in her app and wanted to adapt her route to the changes. Commit push PR approved, CD pipeline picks the new route up. Uh, even though the Alice route is valid, uh, something is wrong. Uh, her changes do not get propagated to the gateway. Uh, she wonders why. Uh, she investigates. And finally, after uh, a couple of hours, after digging into the logs of Kubernetes deployments, she finds out that the reason is Bob's invalid route. 
reports the issue to Pop's team, but most likely she will have to wait until the next day or escalate it to get quicker feedback. So she's not happy about it. And she didn't make anything wrong yet till she cannot update her app's public interface. Why so, you may ask? Well, the reason is that uh, our ingress controller configures the gateway in a way that doesn't allow incremental configuration updates yet. And uh, as far as I know, there's a project that will bring this feature to us uh, in the future. But it means Kit, ca Kit cannot send independent pieces of configuration to Kong and expect it to apply them separately in smaller atomic sets. And uh, there's a post slash config endpoint uh, that accepts the whole configuration blob. And if there's anything wrong in the whole blob, for example, the invalid route that Bob uh, created, uh, the whole configuration is rejected by the gateway. And the only way to get out of the situation is to fix the root cause, uh, which is the Bob's invalid route. Uh, without that, nobody will be able to update any piece of, of configuration that is in the cluster. So uh, we can write it down as here, uh, that we have a set of X and Y uh, entities, uh, and they are both valid. And they are sent as a single blob uh, to the gateway, and they get accepted. If we change X to X prime, which is an invalid one, uh, it's also sent together with Y. And uh, because X prime is invalid, the whole blob gets rejected and we are still uh, in a state where x, y is on the, the data plane side. Uh, because of that, even if we attempt to modify y, making it y prime, we still have this uh, noisy red x prime that makes everything not work as expected. And we also get rejected. In the ideal world where we could uh, send the independent configuration updates, we'd have the situation slightly changed. On the left side, uh, we have the configuration blobs uh, sent to the gateway by a control plane. Uh, on the right, there is an actual DP state. And after sending an initial set of valid X and Y, uh, DP gets into an XY state. As you can see, both of these updates are separate. Uh, when we break uh, X making it, it X prime, it gets rejected, but it's rejected uh, on its own. Uh, it wasn't sent together with any other piece of configuration. So we still are, uh, we, we, our, our DP still remains in X, Y state. Uh, if we want to change uh, Y to Y prime, it gets accepted because uh, it's not sent with anything uh, bundled together with it. So DP gets into a state which is X and Y prime. Uh, and this is something that Alice would like to see. In the fallback configuration feature, uh, we are trying to simulate this behavior on the control plane side. First, as before, XY gets accepted. Uh, giving us x, y state on the DP. Later, x prime y and y uh, are rejected by we get a uh, more detailed response from the gateway, which tells us that uh, the x prime was rejected, by, uh, but uh, y was accepted fine. Uh, in the control plane, we can leverage that information to build uh, a fallback configuration uh, it has the, the, the name of the feature, uh, which is x, y, uh, y, x, and not x prime, because we are taking the last valid version of the, of the object x and put that into the fallback configuration. Thanks to that, the configuration is accepted, but we are still in the same state which we were before, which is x, y, x, y. Uh, next, we attempt to modify y prime. And we again 
get the response uh, telling us that the X prime was rejected by, but Y prime uh, was fine and it was accepted. Uh, of course, it doesn't change the state on the DP side, but we can leverage that information on the CP side. Uh, that makes us generate the fallback configuration, which consists of X, which was the last valid state of X prime of, of, the, of the object X and Y prime. And it gets accepted, leading to the final state on the DP side, uh, X, Y prime, which we were expecting. Uh, so did Alice. All right, so that was uh, a brief introduction to the feature. Uh, now let's go a little back, a little back in time uh, to see uh, our path to improving resilience in terms of config updates, errors, uh, which started more or less back in Kick 2.7 release. Uh, in Kick 2.7, we started by enhancing uh, Prometheus metrics by enabling uh, our users to distinguish uh, flavors of, of config update errors like uh, configuration conflict uh, or network issues or other unexpected unexpected internal errors. In Kick 2.8, we started emitting translation failure events that informed users about the mistakes they made and that were caught by Kick before actually sending them to get to the gateway. In Kick 2.9. We introduced events telling about particular objects being rejected. It allowed inspecting the events uh, and getting info about the root cause of objects being rejected. Uh, so uh, the flow of fixing some mistakes made by the developers would be uh, shorter. In Kick 2.10, we brought new event kinds, successful and failed configuration update events, allowing users to determine if there was a successful or failed config, config push lately, uh, which uh, also proved to be quite useful, uh, for example, to set up monitoring, telling us whether uh, there was a successful push in the last, let's say, five minutes. Uh, in PIC 2.11, uh, we delivered an important building block uh, called last known good configuration. Uh, that allowed using the last valid configuration applied to the gateways to configure new gateway instances that uh, are spawned after upscaling uh, and especially after restarting the ingress controller. Uh, the last known good configuration allowed uh, the control plane to fetch the last valid uh, state from uh, an old gateway instance and use this configuration to, pop to populate new instances with that. Uh, finally, recently in Kick 3.2, uh, we delivered the feature gate that uh, fallback configuration that makes it possible to update independent pieces of configuration despite potential mistakes in the rest of the config. Uh, so in short, uh, how this conf uh, fallback configuration feature works? Uh, first, the controller processes the response it gets from the gateway and links uh, invalid conk entities because in the response we get feedback from the gateway which tells us what conk entities were in incorrect uh, and we link them to their parent Kubernetes objects. Uh, then uh, it determines what is the impact. Uh, the affected objects are resolved using a dependency graph that we build from the Kubernetes uh, objects we uh, have stored. Based on that, uh, all the affected objects are excluded from the temporary cache used for generating, for generating fallback con configuration. Uh, also, uh, if enabled, uh, the objects may get backfilled as well if the, con if the controller has the last valid version at hand. Uh, the fallback config uh, finally is generated using the fallback cache state uh, built uh, in the third and fourth step by excluding or backfilling the objects. Uh, if you prefer visual representation, here's a diagram describing this behavior. Uh, in the normal case, we have the regular con configure con gateway step. Uh, and in, in case 
the configuration gets rejected on the gateway side, uh, we proceed with, with the fallback configuration process. So we exclude the invalid objects uh, along with all of their dependence from the fallback uh, Kubernetes object snapshot. We add a previous valid version of the objects uh, along with their dependence uh, from the previous versions to the fallback snapshot. And we use that snapshot uh, that was modified in two previous steps. Uh, we, we pass it to the translator and it generates the final fallback con configuration that is sent to the gateway. Uh, and we hope it's uh, getting, it, it, it gets accepted by the, go to, by the gateway this time, this time. If it's not, uh, we are in the same situation as we were in the first place, but uh, it's way less probable. Um, having the general understanding of the feature, uh, let's now deep dive into some design decisions uh, that we made during the development of the, of the feature. Um, one of the most uh, important aspects we were consider we were considering was uh, uh, whether we should operate on conc entities or Kubernetes objects level when building the fallback configuration internally. Um, as you can see on the diagram, uh, Kik more or less works uh, in a way that translates Kubernetes objects into conc entities uh, that we can link to. Uh, their parent Kubernetes objects, thanks to the metadata attached to them. Um, after some thought, we decided to go with using Kubernetes objects mainly because this is the interface uh, all of our users understand well, as it's the API they use on, on a daily basis in the end. And uh, Kong entities shouldn't be considered, should be considered an implementation detail because uh, and we, we, we simply didn't want to expose them to the users. Uh, therefore, we operate on the Kubernetes objects collections and uh, we exclude or backfill the broken object. And we, and based on that modified Kubernetes store, we generate the fallback Kong entities. Uh, thanks to that, uh, we can tell our users what exact Kubernetes objects were affected. Uh, excluded or backfilled, and I think it's it makes it easier to understand uh, what's really happening uh, during the process. Um, another problem we had to solve um, was how to make sure we operate on a consistent set of Kubernetes objects between uh, the time that we uh, in that we generate con configuration uh, at the beginning and building the fallback configuration later. Because uh, it's quite reasonable to operate on the same set of uh, objects to uh, not mess something up. We decided to satisfy by extending our cache stores with uh, an auto-generated list all stores method uh, that allows us to easily iterate over, over all objects stored in the, in the store and make a deep copy of all the objects. Um, that's uh, a way for us to not forget uh, about um, adding something to the, uh, adding, uh, adding a support for a new type of objects. Uh, as you may think, it might be expensive to make the copy frequently. Uh, so we also had to take the performance uh, aspect into consideration. Uh, to avoid making a deep copy of the whole cache on every update uh, loop run, we calculate hash of that. And uh, if all the gateways uh, that we uh, that the controller is aware of were successfully configured with the hash we get currently, we simply skip making the copy and the whole update loop. Uh, the hash function takes objects, uh, unique IDs, and resource versions and, as input, uh, which guarantees that the hash changes if objects are added, deleted, or updated, because the resource, the resource version changes on every object change. Um, another problem we had 
to solve was how to determine what objects are affected by a single object being invalid. Uh, we decided to use an inverted dependency graph of the Kubernetes configuration, where the graph uh, edges point from a dependency to its dependent. So this allows us to easily traverse the graph from the broken dependency uh, to all of its affected dependents uh, and also sub-dependents, if there are any. Uh, in order to build the dependency graph, uh, we resolve any references between objects we ingest. So if an HTTP route refers to a service, uh, the service is considered its dependency and the edge is added to the graph. Same goes for any object type we support. Uh, and that requires uh, from us, uh, of course, writing dependency resolvers for every object type. Uh, but fortunately, most of them are quite simple and code can be reused for common stuff like attaching plugins via annotations and so on. So now let's uh, see an example. Let's say the conk plugin is rejected by the gateway uh, that's its red color. And uh, now by walking the graph from the broken objects, for example, using DFS algorithm as in our case, we visit the HTTP route and mark it as affected as the orange color. Uh, similarly, if the HTTP route uh, was a dependency for another object, uh, we uh, have an edge going from the HTTP route to that other object, and it would also be affected by the plugin being broken. In this case, uh, both HTTP route and any of its dependents would be considered as affected as I, as I told you. Uh, knowing the affected object set, uh, both the plugin and route get excluded first. The rest of the objects uh, are not affected and stay as is. Uh, if there was a valid version of those funds, though, they can be backfilled. And that means we pick the conk plugin and the HTTP route using the last, last version, if that was present, and, the, and, and the insert that to the fallback cache state still the rest of the configuration is not affected. The last aspect uh, I wanted to talk about uh, is observability and debuggability, let's say, uh, aspect of, of, of the feature. Uh, because developing it, we wanted to make sure that this quite complex process that is uh, hard to predict what will be the results of, uh, can be properly observed <clears throat> and debugged in case something goes unexpectedly. Uh, so uh, first we emit Kubernetes events on every fallback configuration apply uh, situation, reporting its status. So uh, if, you, if, if it was successfully applied, we get the first event. event. If it uh, was rejected, we get the second one. And we also report possible translation failures uh, that may happen during the translation from fallback Kubernetes store to Kong entities as well. That allows uh, our users to use kubectl to fetch the events and inspect, inspect their details like reason, uh, time of occurrence, etc. Uh, and the events can also be fed into a monitoring stack and set up, and uh, people can set up some alerting uh, based on them. Uh, apart from that, we also implemented various metrics uh, that are ready to be monitored, like uh, fallback configuration pushes count, uh, config snapshot cache misses uh, or hit, duration of generating the fallback cache, and so on. Uh, we highly encourage our users to leverage them to improve visibility of potential issues. Uh, I, uh, I guess that the most useful one that you could monitor would be the time of uh, generating the fallback configuration that is listed here to get some insight how it affects your performance, for example. Uh, for the debug debuggability aspect, uh, we also expose the new debug endpoint uh, that allows users to inspect what particular objects uh, were either broken, excluded, or backfilled as well. 
Uh, and we also uh, can see in the response from the uh, endpoint, what is the current stat status of the uh, fallback configuration process. So it was it, if it was triggered, you get the trigger status. If, it's, if it wasn't triggered, you get not triggered. Potentially in the future, we might get, the, might get there something else. Um, that would be uh, everything I had for the uh, for the theory part, let's say, and uh, uh, it's time for demo. Uh, let's hope everything will work as expected. Um, all right, I have a Kubernetes cluster uh, set up locally. Uh, I have uh, gateway API resources <clears throat> installed already in the cluster, uh, and I will now install a Kubernetes ingress controller using our Helm chart. And uh, what I will do, I will enable the fallback configuration feature gate uh, by making it true. And also I will uh, make the dump config uh, toggle uh, true and that will uh, that will make the ingress controller start the debug uh, HTTP server for the endpoint that I uh, briefly described uh, a slide ago. So let's install it. Mm, we should see that the pods are spinning up. Um, and our example uh, consists of Mm, a very similar case that I described mm, with uh, at the beginning about Bob and Alice. Uh, so we have a set of HTTP routes, uh, two of them. Uh, the first route belongs to Alice. Mm, it's a simpler one and Alice uh, in our case won't break it. And we have the other one, which belongs to Bob. And that one will be uh, broken at some point during our presentation. Uh, you may notice that the uh, Bob's route is associated with a set of conk plugins. Uh, there's uh, a key auth plugin. And also there are two rate limiting plugins. Mm, some of you may know that uh, Kong doesn't allow associating uh, multiple and uh, multiple instances of the um, same plugin type with a single entity, like in our case, it's a route. So if there was nothing else in the cluster uh, with that configuration, uh, we would get an error because there are two instances instances of the rate limiting plugin. Uh, let's see how the plugins are defined. The plugins uh, are simple key auth, uh, the rate limiting base, and rate limiting consumer with some uh, different configurations, but it won't be uh, very important in the presentation. Uh, apart from that, we also have a conk consumer, which uh, as I mentioned, it's not allowed to associate a single uh, plugin type multiple times with a single entity. Uh, so we have the con consumer associated with the same uh, with the same um, plugin as the HTTP route is, and it makes the configuration valid in our case if we apply both con consumer associated with the plugin and the HTTP route associated with that. Uh, we will later leverage this to uh, actually cause a breakage by removing this annotation. Um, the other thing is that we have a service uh, and a deployment, and this is used by both you know, HTTP routes in our case. So it's not exactly as described in the beginning. They now share a common service. Uh, all right, uh, the deployment should be ready. We have some logs. Uh, the 
configuration was successfully uh, synced with the gateway, uh, but there is no configuration uh, applied yet. So let's apply everything that I just showed to you. And we should also see a log that will tell us that the sync was successful. Um, to verify that uh, everything works as we expect, uh, let's try to hit the gateway. Uh, and under root Alice, we get a valid response. Uh, for route Bob, we should also get a valid res response if we pass the API key in the uh, in the headers. If we pass an invalid API key, we get an authorized response. Uh, so in the current state, everything works uh, as expected. There is no uh, fallback configuration feature involved. And to trigger that, we will, as I said, uh, remove the annotation on the con consumer, which will make the configuration invalid. Uh, we remove the annotation and in the logs, we can see that we successfully recovered from configuration rejection with fallback configuration. Uh, that means that we should be able to see uh, something in the debug endpoint uh, that I told you about. So let's port forward um, to the port of the controller that, that exposes the, the debug server. And let's see what it will give us in a response. It's debug slash config slash fallback. Uh, and we get a status triggered. Uh, we have a set of broken objects, which is uh, the conk plugin. And we also have a list of excluded objects. Uh, the excluded objects are the conk plugin itself uh, and the HTTP route. Uh, you can see all of their uh, identity uh, information, uh, but you can also inspect what were the causing objects of, for example, the HTTP route being uh, excluded. In our case, the HTTP route gets excluded because of the broken or the broken conk plugin and the conk plugin gets excluded because of itself. Uh, so that means that uh, we should still be able to hit the route uh, that belong to Alice, but uh, the route that belonged to Bob uh, is no longer configured because it was completely excluded. It is so because we didn't enable uh, a toggle that uh, makes the controller use the last valid state. Uh, but let's not get to that point yet. Uh, let's see if we can modify the uh, route that belongs to Alice, because that was something that she wanted to do in the first place. She had her route configured properly, but uh, after Bob messed something up, she still wants to uh, change something. So she decides to modify uh, her route's uh, path to route Alice modified. She does so, and uh, we expect that uh, we are able to hit that route and it works as expected. And the old uh, route path is not there. Still, route map is not available on the gateway. All right, so that would be uh, the basic functionality of the fallback configuration without backfilling uh, from the uh, last valid state. And now we will uh, upgrade our deployment of the controller. Uh, and we will not only enable the feature gate and the dump config uh, toggle, but also we will use uh, we, we will uh, turn the use last valid config for fallback toggle to true and that will make our uh, controller to use the last valid state for backfilling. 
let's run the comment. We should get another instance. And uh, to actually test that behavior uh, of backfilling, we need to make sure we get back to the valid uh, configuration because uh, the requirement for the backfilling to work is that uh, every um, object we want to backfill uh, has to ha have its last valid state because we restarted the uh, the controller, it has no uh, last valid state for the uh, resources that are broken right now. So let's fix it by uh, annotating the con consumer pack. And let's verify that both uh, route Alice modified is available and route Bob is available. Um, all right. so. We are in a good place. Everything is configured correctly. So we can uh, get back to messing things up. We remove the annotation back. And now we expect that the route belonging to Alice is functional as before, but uh, Bob, Bob's route is uh, working as before as well, because in the current situation uh, for Bob's route, uh, the controller fetched the last valid version of the uh, of the route and of uh, the plugin. So um, actually, to verify what happened, because we may guess, uh, we can we can. Uh, can inspect the debug endpoint. So as before, we have the status triggered. The broken objects are the same. It's the conk plugin. Uh, we have the same set of excluded objects, which is conk plugin and HTTP route. Uh, but we have the third list of objects, uh, the backfield ones. Uh, and the backfield objects are conk plugin, conk consumer, and HTTP route. Uh, con consumer is here because uh, it de it depended on the con plugin which was broken. So because of that relation, it also needed to be backfilled from the last valid state. Uh, so in the current situation, we are still able to modify the route belonging to uh, to Alice. Uh, but we may want to try modifying the route belonging to Bob because it's working now. So maybe uh, we will be able to modify it as well. Uh, well, not really, because uh, that's the limitation. We cannot, uh, cannot work around. The Bob password, uh, for, uh, which was defined in the old credential uh, maybe I, I, I was too quick here. Uh, I defined a secret with, with a new uh, key credential and I associated that with the con consumer uh, Bob. Uh, and I expect that now I will be able to authorize with uh, the old IPA key and the new IPA key, which is Bob new password. So as you can see, I was able to uh, uh, authenticate uh, with the Bob password, but I get unauthorized for Bob new password. So that tells me that I am not able to make modifications to the broken objects. Uh, and I actually need to fix the root cause to make them um, modifiable. So let's do that. Let's fix the broken object by uh, annotating the con consumer bug with the relation to the rate limiting uh, consumer plugin. And now we can verify that the Bob password works, but also Bob new password, uh, which was added 
in the meantime when the plugin was broken. Uh, finally, we can inspect the debug endpoints. We got back to the state where everything is correct. So we only get the status in the response, which tells us that the process wasn't triggered. Mm. So that would be it about my presentation. Uh, thank you for watching, attending, and uh, I will be happy to answer any uh, of questions if you have them. Thank you so much, Greg. That was an awesome demo. Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Guys, take that opportunity to ask Greg some questions. We still have some time to go, so go ahead. I will also... If you want to find us on Slack, we have a con community Slack. Yeah, the recording will be shared shortly um, in the next few hours. We have one question in the chat. Uh, would this handle a scenario where an HTTP route references a non-existent service? Uh, so uh, it uh, it's something that is uh, already handled on a level of the translation in the current implementation. So the feature I was describing wouldn't be even triggered. Uh, the HTTP route we, uh, referring to non-existing service uh, in the current implementation would result in not generating a Kong service and Kong route for that particular uh, rule in HTTP route. Amazing. Let's see if we have any other questions coming up or we can... You're welcome. Okay. All right, looks like we don't have any other questions, um, but if you do, please find us on the Kong community Slack. You can always ask us there on Kong Nation, um, GitHub, anywhere, but the Kong Slack is um, it's a good place to start. Cool. Thank you so much, Greg. It was a pleasure having you in our user call. And thank you so much for joining everyone. We have our next Tech Talk on July 25th. Let me just put the link here. If all of you want to join, it's actually about API security. So another very interesting topic. Here's the link. If you want to join. And with that, let's wrap it up. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Good, good day. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks, folks. Bye.